Hello class, welcome to Motor Control. This is a fantastic, fantastic class. It's a little bit complicated since it's an upper division class, but the knowledge that you'll gain from this, you'll, you'll be surprised. And a lot of times students are into sports, are into orthopedics and say, why do I have to take this class? You'll be surprised at how many theories and how much knowledge you'll gain that you'll be able to carry on in the orthopedic setting as well because neuromuscular control is actually very beneficial. Now, a lot of times people think it's a strength issue, strength issue, but you'll be you'll find that a lot of athletes are actually very strong. They just have deficits in neuromuscular control. Kind of like a squat. If we look at somebody doing a squat, you know that they're strong, but if you look at the way they go down and up, the neuromuscular control just isn't there. In this class, we'll focus mostly on patients that do not have motor control. And those are patients that have after a stroke, after uh, sustaining an injury, uh, cerebral palsy, multiple sclerosis. But going back down to the cellular level, going back down to the basics and understanding why these deficits occur, we can actually use that knowledge in the orthopedic setting as well. So it's a fantastic course. I love this class uh, and I'm excited to teach it. So let's start. First of all, whenever you take a class this semester, when you, before you approach it, before you dive in and start making flashcards and start studying, you always want to consider this. Why am I taking this class and how will this class help your education and career? Sit back, relax, and think about this. So your end goal throughout the semester is what is the purpose of this because we get so busy and caught up in taking tests quizzes and papers and stuff like you're thinking well why am I doing this okay so always understand why you're taking a course and I'll individually maybe ask you and say what do you what do you think what, what do you think you'll get out of this uh, I won't put you on the spot don't worry but think about this as we go through the first week or so and think about how this class will help your career how it will help your education and don't just think of it as, oh, I have to take it because I have to graduate and it's a requirement. That's the wrong uh, attitude that you want with any. If you really want to learn something, if you really want to gain something, this is the approach that I want you to think. So why are you taking this class besides it's a prerequisite for graduation? And how will this class help your education career? Okay. Think about it throughout the semester and think about it during the first week. It'll really help you and it'll help motivate you to do well. So, so let's start. Movement, obviously, you know, is critical, critical in the aspect of life. We're eating, we're running, we're playing, we're working. We have to have movement. It's essential to our ability to walk, run, play, to seek out and eat food that nourishes us, to communicate with friends and family, to earn our living. In essence, basically, movement is needed to survive. The field of motor control is directed at studying the nature of movement and how movement is controlled. So the, the basic definition of motor control is the ability to regulate or direct the mechanisms essential to movement. Most of us sitting here will take motor control for granted. You don't think about, hey, I'm sitting here and I'm typing on the keyboard or moving my mouse or uh, pushing on the iPhone or you're probably multitasking you're just kind of sitting there and you probably have your screen up with your name up and you're probably eating breakfast or drinking coffee and doing all these things that you don't really have to think about but think about if you had a brain injury think about if you were uh, neurologically uh, delayed how much effort it would take to do the simple tasks that you and I take for granted so when we bake it and break it down a little bit you'll realize that Movement in itself, the ability to sit, the ability to walk, the ability to run is actually very, very complicated. And we really don't realize how complicated it is until we cannot do it. So, and we'll break down case studies and we'll take different scenarios and we'll really emphasize the ability to say, okay, well, how much effort does it really take for me to pick up a pencil, to put on my shirt, to just go from sit to stand? And you realize that it actually is a lot of effort. Okay. 
All right, so why should therapists study motor control? And whatever your career path is, whether you're going to go into OT, PT, athletic training, sports medicine, whatever the case is, motor control is beneficial for everyone. Physical and occupational therapists, applied motor control physiologists, understanding motor control and the nature and control of normal and abnormal movement is critical to clinical practice. So I always emphasize, even in my anatomy classes, I always have to teach you what normal is so that you can pick out abnormal. Now look at this cute little kid right here, you right? So you don't realize the developmental stages and the movement patterns that a child goes through. So if you look at this, he's on his back, then he learns to roll over, then he learns to go quadruped, then he learns to sit on his knees, and then he stands. These are the developmental stages that we go through. This is the developmental stages that your brain goes through. So think about somebody that had a stroke. What happens is, when you were in your mom's womb, right, you were kind of in that fetal position, and which is the first curves that usually occur. Afterwards, when you come out, we your brain starts to develop and we learn to tummy time and get our head into extension, thoracic extension, and then go quadruped sit. So when somebody has a stroke, we actually go back to the basic developmental stages and we teach a patient that has had a stroke to go on their back, the ability to roll over. Can they get into quadruped? Can they sit? And can they stand? So we're taking that brain through the developmental sequence back again, right? So you understand the the more you understand normal, you'll be able to rehab abnormal. So I will take you through all the stages and teach you lots of things. Uh, I love uh, this class. Again, it, uh, a lot of times that people love orthopedics, and they say, well, this Patel is not going to apply to me because I'm only going to do sports medicine. I'm only going to do basketball and I'm only going to do uh, uh, athletes. Uh, well, yes and no. If you can take these simple steps and apply that to the athlete, you will actually be that much better. So let me give you an example. I had a patient. He was a track and uh, field star and he had actually, he was just built like a rock, but he actually had issues with developmental control and what I did is I asked him to just roll from his back onto his stomach, right? Dissociate upper motor, uh, upper extremity versus lower extremity. He actually had very difficulty rolling. He had no problems rolling from his back to his stomach, but he had a lot of difficulty rolling from his stomach to his back. And just the inability to dissociate upper from lower uh, can play uh, havoc. So what happens is that he had actually uh, very poor control of his glutes, of his uh, back, and we worked on just rolling. You imagine just pra practicing rolling uh, uh, on an elite athlete and that will improve their performance? Yes. Basically, we took motor control right here, 101, think of you as a baby, going back to the developmental stages and teaching that athlete to be able to dissociate and go back to step one and unreal results. Uh, so uh, you'll you'll find that as we go through class, you'll you'll be able to take your your athletes and maybe take them back. So we're always want to say, okay, how many box jumps can you do? Single leg stance with a pistol squat while holding 500 uh, pounds kettlebell and uh, blindfolded, right? <laughs> and you're you're like, okay, well that's that's great. But if they can't even stand on one leg to begin with, all your pistol squats with uh, kettlebells and blindfolded will have no carryover, absolutely. Okay, so make sure that they can do basic functions first before you progress them. We are so excited about watching Instagram and watching the latest exercises of how someone can do a, 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 a squat on a Swiss ball. Uh, but if they can't even do a squat on level ground, then it makes no sense to put them on a Swiss ball. I hope that makes sense. And, you know, what I like you to do, instead of me just talking, 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 let's have a, a active community here in the chat. Say, yeah, you know what, Patel? Yeah, I've tried that with my athlete, blah, blah, blah. blah. So stop me anytime and raise your hand and let's have a, a open communication because that's the only way in class we would have this open communication so I want these zoom meetings and I want this to be interactive and let's learn from each other I'm not gonna say that I know everything because I don't want to be I do know a lot 
So I, I, I do want to make sure that you understand I do know a lot, but you guys know a lot too. And being able to share your knowledge with me and then me taking it to the next level will help us all learn together. Okay. Now, let's understand the nature of movement. So what, what it is it? So that you have an individual such as yourself, you have the task that you want to perform, and what's the environment that you want to perform in. So let's, uh, we have to take all of these into consideration. So if a patient lives alone, lives on a two-story house, has to go up and down stairs, has to reach into cabinets, what's the environment that they're in? What's the individual? What's the task that they're starting to perform? And all that plays a key role in movement. So as simple as an individual is, let's say, having to reach up into a cupboard, okay? Where do they live? Do they live by themselves? Do they have any kind of deficits? Um, or just walking themselves, right? Walking, what's the task? The task is walking. What's the individual? Individuals here, what kind of environment? Are they going to walk on carpet? Are they going to walk on concrete? Are they going to walk on grass? Are they going to walk in the rain? Now, in rehab, we cannot reproduce every kind of environmental factor that a patient is going to encounter, right? Even with athletes, we can only train them to a certain extent. We will not be able to reproduce every kind of environmental factor. We do the best we can. We do the basics and then go from there. So always understanding the individual, the task, and the environment, and that leads to movement. So this is a great, great little uh, uh, image here. And as we go on, you'll be, and I'll try to relate this to orthopedics as well. So I want you to get, because my background is orthopedics, my background is sports, my background is rehab. So I'm going to give you that, but I'll be honest with you, I use 99% of the principles that I'm going to teach you in this class in the orthopedic setting. So you're going to learn a lot from me, I hope. Uh, those that have taken this class from me in the past, they said fantastic uh, things. And um, I, I I'm easy going guys, so yeah, yeah, I want you to learn the best that you can and I'll teach you all the knowledge that I can because I want you to be the best uh, uh, physical therapists, uh, OTs, athletic trainers, uh, PTs that you can be. Um, all right, so now we have to understand individual systems underlying motor control. So motor actions and systems, you have a neuromuscular control and you have a biomechanical system. The study of motor systems that control functional movement. The body is characterized by a high number of muscles and joints. You know that. There's over 600 uh, muscles in the bodies, uh, right? So th th there's a lot of muscles, all of which must be controlled during the execution of coordinated functional movement. And there are also multiple ways a movement can be carried out. So there's not one way to skin a cat. Right, they they say that. I know it's a little graphic, uh, but there are there's not one way to run. There's not one way to walk. There's not one way to go up and down stairs. So we have to look at an individual's movement patterns and be able to correct it if they're not being efficient. The key is efficient. You ever you ever people watch? Uh, unfortunately, we're not on campus, but watch people or just students walk, and you'll be like, oh man, how does that guy get from one class to another? He's wasting so much energy. Uh, right? And it's like, God, yeah, I, I wish I could just make you more efficient. And so there, those are the things that we want to look at. We look at a patient and say, boy, you're expending too much energy just doing one thing, a simple task such as walking. If we can make improvements, that would be great. Okay. All right. Understanding the nature of movement, individual systems underlying movement, there are a lot of systems at play. Okay, and one of the key systems is sensory and perceptual systems. They are essential to controlling the functional movement. Perception, integration of sensory impressions into psychologically meaningful information. Provide information about the state of the body. Integral to ability to act effectively within an environment. So if you look at this, you know, the sensory and perceptual systems. Now this is a complicated uh, uh, task, which is hitting a... a a tennis ball with a racket, right? There's a lot of things going on here. So uncertainty, where's the ball going to be? Where will it, when will it, and where will it strike the racket? You have sensory for the racket, you have motor control. So this noise, multiple degrees of freedom. There's over 200 joints and 600 muscles we have to control. Okay, The time varying positions, what tool to use, muscle fatigue, 
hitting the ball first thing in the match versus last thing in the match uh, two hours into the match is going to play a key role. Time delays, what is the perception, the actual, and the complex dynamics. Raising the arm causes postural instability, so you're instable here. So just this little act alone, think about how complicated it is, all the systems that are working together. So think about somebody in the setting that has a cognitive deficit. Somebody, unfortunately, that has, let's say, a stroke. Somebody that has cerebral palsy. They are developmentally delayed. So just the simple act of walking or reaching, they're going to have sensory and perceptual deficits already. So we're going to have to take it back a notch and be able to work with that system. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. Now the system that we'll probably focus on the most in this class is the cognitive system, which is what? The neuromuscular system. That's essential to motor control. So we have to have intent. So what is the reason that we're moving? What is the intent? What is our intention? But cognitive systems take attention, planning, problem solving, motivational, and emotional aspects of motor control that underline the establishment of intent or goals. Now think about a patient or somebody that has neurological deficit. Their cognitive system is not working the way that you and I would have our cognitive system. So they are going to have less attention, less planning, less ability to problem solve, maybe not even motivated. And there's a lot of emotional aspects dealing with trauma, dealing with uh, certain aspects of their neurological deficit that you and I will have to deal with. So the cognitive system is going to be something that we have to pay close attention to. But the more you understand it, it's going to be uh, that much better. Now, what are task constraints on movement control? Okay, and this is very under, uh, very um, simple, but you have to understand this concept. The type of task performed has great impact on neural organization and movement. Open movement, adapt movement strategies to constantly change an unpredictable environment, playing sports, soccer, tennis. Then you have closed movement in a relatively fixed or predictable environment, sitting, standing, or non-moving. And then in rehab, we start with the stability task on a fixed environment, and then we move to an open environment. Okay? And, the, and the reason that this makes sense is that I don't want you to somebody let, think about this. Think about somebody that had a stroke or somebody that uh, had a brain injury. You're not going to have them play sports or soccer or going to have them run on a treadmill without being able to just have them sit or stand first. And like I mentioned early on is sometimes we try to progress our patients orthopedically or neurologically too fast and then we don't have the basics down and then they're going to fail at the more complicated task and you might even injure them. So injury is the key too from a liability standpoint. So we want to make sure that we can do a closed movement pattern first before we move on to an open movement pattern. Environmental constraints on movement control, the central nervous system, consideration of attributes of environment when playing, planning, task-specific movements, regulatory features, aspects of environment that shape the movement itself, the weight, size of the cup, and non-regulatory features of environment that may affect performance, but movement does not have to conform to these features, background noise, distractions, a TV, a spouse, right? So there are some things that we can correct. There are some things that we cannot correct and that would constrain our movement, right? So well, let's say you're asking a patient to walk or just uh, go from sit to stand. Well, you have all this background noise in a gym. You have distractions. You might have a TV in the background. You might have the spouse that's constantly saying, come on, honey, you can do it. You can do it. Although that's uh, good, but sometimes uh, people or patients with neurological uh, issues, they can't have too much noise around it distracts them too easily so there these are things that we have to control but we can control the weight size of an object all right so let's say the size of the cup is too uh, large well we can go for a smaller cup let's say the weight is five pounds well we can drop it to one pound let's say the object is something that's oblong well we can make it more cylindrical so there are some things that we can control and there are some things that are out of our control so being able to understand regulatory versus non-regulatory uh, uh, 
constraints is important and when we establish our movement control.